Let's dive into to God's word. Today I want to talk to you on the person of peace. The person of peace. When we think about Christmas and what we've all come to know Christmas as, you guys see like nativity sets and mangers and there's such a peace about Christmas, you know, and, and our carols that we sing. Uh, maybe y'all could help me to finish some of these carols. Uh, oh, little town of Bethlehem, how? Three of you guys know that song. How still I see you lie. And you guys have all seen the, like, the pictures of like the little quaint town of Bethlehem. And it's just like the perfect twinkling star is out. And it just seems like everything is just so peaceful. Or silent night, holy night, all is... Okay, we got about 10 of you guys know that one. It's not all has come, it's all is calm. I just taught some of you, some of y'all been saying, all is calm. <laughs> it's, it's calm. Uh, there's a verse in O Holy Night, truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and is peace. Come on, somebody hold up two fingers and say peace. 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 His gospel is peace. But in this, in, in this Christmas season, peace is one of the massive themes uh, and, and we always take such peace looking at the little quaint town of Bethlehem or looking at the, the manger. But what a paradox it is to our, our true world, right? In, in this world, it's everything but peaceful. Would you guys agree that when you like look at the landscape of the globe today, it doesn't feel like peace. And many people felt like the smarter we got, the more educated we got, the more intelligent that, that the human race became, that we would have more peace. But it doesn't seem to be the case. Like when you look across the landscape of, of the world, it doesn't really matter how much we know. We can have Wikipedia, we can have Google, we can have all of the things, and there is still a lack of peace. The world doesn't seem peaceful. And uh, I wanna introduce you to this word, and you've heard this word probably a lot. It's the word shalom. Look at somebody and say shalom. Shalom. Say it twice. Say shalom, shalom. The Bible actually does use shalom, shalom t uh, together in one verse, and we're going to conclude the whole sermon by reading that verse, but say shalom, shalom. So the word shalom is where we get the word peace. And what does shalom mean? If you're looking at a big piece of chocolate pie, meringue on top, this yummy whipped cream, chocolate pie. And then it's what that represents right there is peace. Say amen. amen. A big old chocolate pie, that's peace. Now, when I take a slice away from the pie, it's no longer at peace because I've extracted something that makes it whole. And so the word shalom means wholeness. It means perfection. And when something is not whole, it has lost its peace. You know, if you get a brand new iPhone, there's nothing better than a pure, brand new, undented, unscratched, straight out of the box iPhone. Cables clean. I mean, it's just beautiful. I mean, you raise your hand if you got a cracked screen right now. You, you got a cracked screen. It's just not the same, right? The experience is not the same. I mean, you look at it and it's got that chip on there and you just can't wait to get an upgrade. Or you can't wait to figure out how to get that screen fixed because when something is not perfect, when it's not in its original state, when it's not whole, it doesn't have shalom. But when something is perfect and it's all there, it has shalom. Maybe you moms can uh, relate to this, but if you have children and they're out and they're not all at home, something doesn't feel complete about your house. And if your kids are to the age where they can drive and they can go places and they tell you they're gonna be home late at night, I guarantee you, you stay up until they get home because the house is not at peace until they're there. That is the word shalom. For a shepherd, if he would miss one of his sheep, there was no peace because somebody, something was missing. 
And, and that is the state of our world right now. And this is what everybody needs to understand. You wonder, why is there evil in the world? Why in Africa do kids starve to death? Why is there pain and why is there suffering? It's because the world is no longer at a place of shalom. We're not perfect. We're not whole. We're not complete. This is the tension. And, and this is what everybody needs to know is that God created our world to be at shalom, to be at peace. I mean, when he created it, he said, it is good. When he created it, he said, it is perfect. There wasn't anything about nature. I mean, there were no lions chasing uh, beautiful deer down and, and tearing them apart. You know, you go on a safari or you watch a video on YouTube of a safari and you're like, man, something is not at shalom right there, right? This, is, this seems broken. And our entire world is at a place of incompleteness and brokenness and un, unwholeness. And we feel this uh, in every way of life. Uh, sin has caused our world to lose its shalom. And we see this really in four main categories. First of all, we see this in our relationship with God. Most people can say, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. It's not whole. And before Jesus Christ and before anybody here met Christ, your relationship with God was far from what we see in Genesis with Adam walking with God in the cool of the day, Adam being God's man, Adam being the person God trusted to rule over everything. Something's broken there. Like people would honestly say, yeah, I don't ever hear from him. I don't ever talk to him. I don't know him. We would say we're not at peace with God. If we really knew how severe it is, it's not just we're not, something's missing. We're literally at war. We're at war with God. And if people understood, like, look, the, the iPhone screen's broken. The pie is eaten. The, the, the beautiful gazelle is destroyed. I mean, <laughs> between us and God, something is amiss. And the second way that it's amiss is in our relationships with one another. Think about the pain and suffering that people cause each other. Like, we're not at peace with each other. We look around the world, nations fight against nations, and even the most advanced nations in the world, you look at China and, and U.S.'s relationship right now, look at Russia and U.S.'s relationship, you look at these great nations, these are the leading nations in the world, and, and there's, there's something broken, something missing. You look at the, the races and, and the conflict between races, and you say, this is not shalom, this is not peace. And we see this, so this brokenness between us and God and this brokenness between others. And then this, this brokenness within ourselves, we're lack of shalom in ourselves to where we're not even at peace with ourselves, our destiny, our, 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 who God made us to be. Like within ourselves, we're not at peace. And people search for peace within themselves in so many ways. They look to other religions, they, they stress out, they do all kinds of things to try to find peace within themselves, but that is broken. And then we look at nature itself and nature is not at shalom. People are freaking out right now about climate change and what's happening to the globe. The Bible says in Romans eight that the earth is crying out. It's groaning, all creation is groaning. I mean, nature itself is not at peace. So now I wanna read the scripture. And now I wanna point us to what's God's solution to bring shalom back into our lives? How many of you want peace? You want wholeness? You want truly perfection? Like, I want it to be perfect. I want my relationships with you to be perfect. I wanna feel on the inside, I wanna feel whole. I want my relationship with God to be perfect. And does God have a plan for that? In Isaiah chapter nine, verse five, if you have your Bible, turn there real quick because I want you to put your eyes on the script. If you have your phone, uh, you can do that. Don't look at Instagram, don't Snapchat right now, but, but you can look at Isaiah chapter nine, verse five. This is what the scripture says. And this is a prophecy. This is 600 years before Christ. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms blood stained by war will all be burned. This is just a symbol that we're not gonna need to fight anymore. We're not gonna need to be at war anymore. They will be fuel for the fire. For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Shalom. It's that word. He's gonna be the ruler 
of perfect perfection, of peace. His government and its peace will never end. So like he's gonna set up a perfect government and it's called the kingdom of God. The kingdom will come to earth and of its peace that it will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. This is a prophecy that a son will be given from God to us to restore shalom to the world. And then if we look in Luke chapter two and verse 13, this is why the second candle that we're gonna light today is called the candle of the shepherds. The first was the candle of the prophets and it symbolizes hope. This one is the candle of the shepherd and it symbolizes peace. Luke chapter two, verse 13, the shepherds are all in the field watching their sheep. Isn't it amazing that God chose shepherds to send angels to? Not rulers, not the kings, not the governors. He, he chose shepherds. They're bored at night and all of them, one of them says, I see a shooting star. That's no shooting star. That's an angel. Oh my God. You know, just play out what what that was like. And they're they're sitting there experiencing the angels of God. And at first it was just one of them telling them, don't be afraid. And then the whole host of heaven, and this was their message about Christ. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast, of a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. What they're saying is the prophecy that would happen 600 years ago that a son would be given and his peace would rule. They're saying this moment has come and peace is returning to planet earth. I'm not talking about in 2021. We're talking about 2000 years ago, God gave his son to the earth as the beginning uh, of shalom. And now this shalom is not completely realized in all the world yet and it will be. Death is the last foe that will be defeated. But this shalom has begun inside of us. It has begun and we are people of peace. But I want you today, because when I was thinking about peace, I mean, the Bible is filled with thoughts about peace. But I really just wanna talk to you about Jesus. I wanna talk to you about the person of peace, Jesus Christ. And I want you to see him in four specific ways. And this is beautiful if you'll see it this way. The first way I want you to see him is I want you to see him as the gift of peace. If you look at diplomatic gifts and what a diplomatic gift would be is when one nation is trying to make peace with another nation, they send them a gift. Some of the funny ones that I've uh, heard about is, you know, in World War II, you've heard of Holland, you've heard of the Netherlands. Well, they wanted out. They didn't want in the war at all, but they were right there next to Germany. So there was no way they could stay out of the war. And the royal family of the Netherlands had to flee from, from the Netherlands because the Germans came in. And so Canada actually took the royal family, the, the, the royal Dutch family into their nation. So as a gift from the Dutch royal family to the nation of Canada, they sent 100,000 tulips to the nation of Canada. And did you know that every year since then, they have sent 10,000 tulips to Canada as a symbol of their peace? And this is, a, this is a diplomatic gift that says, we, we want peace and we appreciate your kindness to us. Did you know they sent 10,000 tulips to Canada every year? I bet you didn't know that. My question is, how do they stay alive? Uh, I mean, they have to send them on a fast jet. But uh, another, another one that's right in front of our eyes is the Statue of Liberty. You go to, uh, if you go to Manhattan, you see the Statue of Liberty. The nation of France in 1881 wanted to symbolize their appreciation and desire for peace with America. So they created the Statue of Liberty. And every time you hear somebody say, French people don't like Americans, Americans don't like French people, just tell them the Statue of Liberty says that we're, that we're, at, good, <laughs> we're at good terms, right? <laughs> if only everybody knew that. But, but uh, here's just one last one. China in uh, 1972 wanted to do something to Amer- for America to say that, that we wanted to be at peace. And so they gave us two pandas. Did you know they gave us two pandas? Uh, the names of the panda was Sing Sing and Ling Ling. <laughs> and uh, Ling Ling just passed away. So uh, I don't know what that means, but <laughs> hope it's not a symbol of our peace. <laughs> But gifts, diplomatic gifts, 
when you look at Jesus Christ, the baby in the manger, what you have to see in that is that God was saying to humanity, I want to have peace with you. This is a gift from heaven to humanity that God wants peace. Now, God didn't send a statue like the Statue of Liberty. He didn't send pandas. He didn't send even a tree of life. He could have just let a tree of life come back down from heaven that we could all live forever. He could have sent anything, and he sent his only son as a symbol of peace. How powerful that is that God sent his son as a token of peace. Now, let's personalize this thought. Every bit of tension that you've ever felt with God, every distance that you felt with God, any brokenness that you feel in your relationship with God, and you've wondered, does God want to know me? Does God want to love me? You need to look at the token of peace and personalize it. Don't just globalize it. Don't just say it's for everybody. No, say it's for me. And Jesus came for me. When you look at baby Jesus in the major, don't say that's for the world. It is for the world, but personalize it and say that is a gift. God has made a symbol. He has made a, 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 a clear token of his desire for shalom, and he is the gift of peace. Come on, tell the Lord, thank you. Thank you, God, for peace, that you desire peace with me. The second way that I want you to see Jesus is that he is the prince of peace. He's the gift of peace, and then he is the prince of peace. When you say prince, you're talking about government, you're talking about authority, and Jesus literally is the governor, the king, the prince of shalom. Like he embodies shalom. When he stood on the bow of that boat and he looked at that raging storm and he commanded, peace be still, you can't command something you don't have. You can't command something that you are not. He literally is the ruler, the prince of shalom, of peace, and he embodies peace. So when you come to Jesus, he literally represents perfection, wholeness, peace, and he has peace for all of us. He embodies peace, and, and part of his uh, being the prince of peace is that he brokers peace. Matthew 5 says that blessed are the peacemakers. We are to be like Jesus. Did you know that shalom is, is actually in some cases used as a verb? You can shalom somebody. <laughs> I just shalomed you. <laughs> you can literally shalom somebody in, in Hebrew. And that, that means that I brought peace to you. Jesus is a broker of peace. So when he sets up his eternal kingdom, the Bible says there will be no more war. There's not going to be because he is a genius at brokering peace. He knows all hearts. He knows all motives. He knows everything. And he's going to broker peace between the nations. He's going to broker. He is the embodiment of peace. He's a broker of peace. And look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. Now, I like, when he says Jews and Gentiles, I like to take every class, every race, everything, and just put it in those two worlds and say that, say, say that he united. He is a broker of peace. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. So he is a broker of peace. And so let me ask you this. He's your master. He is your, uh, your Lord. Are you a broker of peace? Do you shalom people? Do you bring peace into scenarios? Are you a person of war? Are you a person of strife? Are you a person of contention with your words, with your, with your mouth? Or are you a person of peace? When you show up, does peace start to come in the room with you? Is, are, are bridges built? Are, are relationships healed? Are you a person of peace? So Jesus brokers peace. He also is going to rule with peace. It's going to be what he's known for. When Jesus comes back, he's going to bring peace. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 17. I will exchange your bronze for gold, your iron for silver, your wood for bronze, and your stones for iron. I will make peace your leader and righteousness your ruler. His very presence is going to create peace between nations. His peace will come from his perfect wisdom and his omniscience. And he's going to enforce peace. He's not going to tolerate a lack of peace. Like there will be no gossip. 
There will be no slander. There will be no strife and war. I mean, the Prince of Peace is going to bring peace. Isn't that awesome? He is the gift of peace. And then he is the prince of peace. The third way I want you to see him is that he is the giver of peace. This is where it gets exciting because he's God's gift. We see him as the prince, but then will he give me peace? Will he dispense peace to me? Like in my brokenness, in my imperfection, and in my, in my chaos, will he dispense peace? And yes, he is the giver of peace. If you look at Jesus when he did miracles, he would always say, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. The disciples were all afraid and anxious in the upper room, and he walked in, and the first thing he said, peace be unto you. Isn't it interesting when you read the epistles from Paul? All of them says, grace and peace be unto you. Not grace and money be unto you. Grace and healing be unto you. Grace and, grace and peace. Because this is what Christ can dispense, and this is what he can give. Look at John 14, verse 27. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. No drug, no pharmacy, no, no alcohol, nothing can dispense peace like Jesus can give peace. He says it's a peace that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Here's the point. If you need peace, Come to Jesus and say, Lord, give me peace. I need shalom. I need your peace in my life. And then finally, I want you to see him as the sacrifice for peace. When you look at the cross and you see the embodiment of peace nailed to a tree, crown of thorns on his head, blood running down his body, he is the sacrifice for our peace Isaiah chapter 53 and verse five says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Listen, look, look at this, guys. Put your eyes on the screen. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds, we are healed. Say this with me. Peace has a price. Peace has a price. <clears throat> Peace has a price. And when you see the cross of Jesus Christ, we always look at the manger and we rejoice in the season that he was born, but really that was just the infancy of what was to come. God's total plan was him on that cross. That was peace. That was the sacrifice. That was the price of our peace. You know, in a war, when drastic things happen, horrible things happen, there are moments when people say enough is enough and they drop their stuff and they walk away. If you consider what happened in World War II in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the day after those bombs dropped and what happened in those two cities happened, Japan said, we're done. The world said, we're done in many ways. When something so horrible takes place, people back away and say, that's it. When we look at the cross of Jesus and we gather together under the cross of Jesus and we look at the Son of God, the symbol of perfection, the one who created everything, hanging naked on a tree, we should look at that and drop our swords. We should look at that and say, it's over. Go home, everybody. The war is over. And this is the war between nations, the wars between races, the war between husbands and wives, and the wars between families. Look at a bloody, dead Savior, God's symbol of peace, and we should drop our swords. Say, go home. It's over. So he is the sacrifice for our peace. This is something I want you to grab from this message is that peace is not the absence of problems. It's the presence of the Prince of Peace. Because here's the thing, I want you to catch this. If the person who can make it all right is standing right in front of you, it doesn't matter what's broken because you are with the Prince of Peace. The presence of perfection, the presence of the Prince of Peace and just his presence alone is the symbol 
It's all going to be okay. So peace is not the absence of trouble. It's just the presence of the Prince of Peace. And this is what this candle represents. This is what Christmas is all about, is that God wants us to have peace. Now, I want to close with that scripture that I said has shalom, shalom. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. It says, you will keep in perfect peace. Now, the translators had to say perfect peace because if you go look it up, it says, you will keep in shalom, shalom. So they couldn't say, you will keep in peace, peace. So they just said, you're going to keep in perfect peace. This shalom, shalom, all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. So shalom, shalom is yours. When you look to Jesus, you stay close to him. You keep your thoughts on him. That peace will fill your heart. There will be peace between you and God. There's gonna be peace between you and others and you will be a carrier of peace. How many of you wanna walk into rooms and bring God's peace? How many of you wanna walk into your family, into your house and, and bring God's peace? Keep your eyes on Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Stay with him, be with him, abide in him. In John chapter 15. You're going to have this life. Father, we thank you for your peace that passes all understanding, perfect peace, guarding our hearts and minds. And Jesus, thank you that you bring peace into our crazy, crazy world. Lord, I pray right now that we would not be people of sin, people of chaos, people of, of, of the craziness of this world. But Lord, I pray we would be people of peace. We would bring peace everywhere that we go. Lord, I pray that this message bears fruit in our lives and that we, are, we become peacemakers. In Jesus' name.